Okay, so get ready. Because today we are going deep into the world of obesity. Ooh, sounds intense. It is, actually. You've said some fascinating research for this Jeep Dive. We're going to be talking about... A lot? Yeah, a lot. <laughs> the brain, hormones, genetics... Even temperature? Even temperature. It's clear that the science of weight regulation is, well, it's a lot more complicated than that old calories in, calories out idea. It really is. So, to help us unpack all of this, we have our expert with us. Happy to be here. So maybe we could start with the brain. Okay. I was reading about some research from way back in the 1940s. Wow, that's a while ago. Yeah. Scientists were already experimenting on a part of the brain called the hypothalamus. Right. They found that if they damaged certain parts of the hypothalamus, it could make animals either eat like nonstop or like barely eat at all. It's true. And those early studies, I mean, they were pretty basic yeah. compared to what we can do today, but they really did lay the groundwork for understanding the role of the hypothalamus. Like, oh. that's how we figured out that it's a key player in how our bodies manage energy. Yeah, and they even identified specific areas inside the hypothalamus, the nuclei, that seem to control different aspects of eating behavior. Exactly. Like, think about it. There's one area that tells you to start eating, another that tells you to stop. Okay, but here's something I don't understand. Yeah. If we've known about the role of the hypothalamus for so long, why haven't we figured out how to, like you know target it yeah target it to treat obesity well i think a lot of it comes down to just how clever evolution is like right. from an evolutionary perspective our brains are hardwired to prevent us from starving that makes sense so over time the hypothalamus it's evolved to have all these backup systems to make sure we eat enough it's really really good at its job i mean we know that which also means that it's incredibly resistant to uh well to manipulation when it comes to weight loss. Okay, so it's like our brains are playing this long game focused on survival, even if it means we gain some weight along the way. Pretty much. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. But what about the signals our bodies send to the brain? Like I'm thinking of leptin. Ah, leptin. This hormone released by fat cells. For a while there, people thought leptin was gonna be like the magic bullet for obesity. Yeah, the cure. Yeah. Leptin was a huge discovery. It confirmed that fat itself communicates with the brain it tells the brain, you know, how much energy we have stored. Hmm. So the thinking was that if you had enough fat, your body would release leptin and that would tell the brain to stop eating. Okay. But um, turns out that a lot of people with obesity actually have high levels of leptin. Really? Yeah, but their brains don't respond to it properly. So their brains are basically just ignoring the stop eating signal. Pretty much. That's so frustrating. It is. It's one of the big mysteries we're still trying to solve. For sure. Well, one of the studies that you sent... Uh, Hypothalamic vitamin D improves glucose homeostasis and reduces weight, mm -hmm. suggests a connection between vitamin D and the brain. Interesting, right? Yeah. Like, who knew vitamin D had anything to do with weight? Yeah, it's pretty wild. In this study, researchers delivered vitamin D directly to the brains of obese rodents. Oh, and it actually improved their glucose tolerance and reduced their food intake. And get this, they were able to pinpoint this effect to specific nuclei within the hypothalamus. So vitamin D is like actually impacting the brain's control of appetite and metabolism. Seems that way. And it just goes to show how interconnected these systems really are. Yeah. There's way more to vitamin D than just healthy bones. But I wonder, like, what happens when the communication between the body and the brain gets messed up? <sighs> could inflammation be a factor? It definitely could. There's a growing amount of evidence that suggests that if you eat too much fat, it can actually trigger an immune response in the hypothalamus. Oh, wow. And that leads to inflammation. And over time, if that inflammation becomes chronic, it can actually disrupt the brain's ability to effectively regulate energy balance. So it's not just about like faulty signals, but about the brain itself becoming damaged by inflammation. Yeah, it's like a vicious cycle. And then there was also this research on these things called metalloproteinases or MMPs. Oh, yeah, MMP. They're enzymes that break down the stuff that supports our cells, the uh, extracellular matrix. That's right. And the studies on MMPs are pretty fascinating. One study, um, associations of matrix metalloproteinase, MMP8, MMP9, and their inhibitor, tissue inhibitor of metalloproteinase 1, with obesity-related biomarkers in apparently healthy adolescent boys, found that MMP8 levels were actually linked to elevated liver enzymes in teenage boys. Wait, but what does that mean for, like, the average person? Well, so elevated liver enzymes can actually be an early warning sign of metabolic problems even before someone becomes obese. Oh, huh? wow. It's like a, a canary in a coal mine. And it seems like 
these MMPs and their inhibitors, TIMPs, they seem to play a role in regulating how fat tissue functions and how the body uses energy. It's like yet another layer of complexity to this whole picture. So we've got the hypothalamus, hormones, inflammation, and now these MMPs. It's a lot. It is. But um, what about the psychological side of things? Like we all know that food can be so tempting yeah. and it sometimes feels like our brains are working against us. You're right. I mean, our brains have this built-in reward system, right? And the system makes us feel good when we do things that are essential for survival, like eating. Right. But the thing is, we live in a world surrounded by highly palatable, calorie-dense foods, and that's where the system can backfire. Yeah, like when you're feeling stressed and you just crave that bag of chips. Exactly. Even though you know you're not actually hungry. Is that our brain's reward system, like hijacking our better judgment? Pretty much. There's a study, uh, Brain Functional and Structural Magnetic Resonance Imaging of Obesity and Weight Loss Interventions, which talks about how fMRI studies have actually shown that when people with obesity see images of food, they show more activity in the reward-related areas of the brain. Oh, interesting. It's like their brains are wired to find food more rewarding. Wow, so it's not just about willpower there are actually real biological forces at play. Exactly. Okay, but then how does our brain know when we're actually hungry versus just wanting a treat? Well, it comes down to the interplay between two systems. So you've got the homeostatic system, and that regulates our energy balance based on our body's needs. And this is the one that tells us to eat when we're truly hungry and to stop and we've had enough. Okay. And then you have the hedonic system, and that's all about pleasure and reward. Okay. So that's the system that makes you crave dessert even when you're full. Ah, uh, that makes sense. Uh -huh. So in a perfect world, these two systems would be working together, right? Right, in perfect harmony. But with obesity, that balance is off. Exactly. And when that hedonic system takes over, it can lead to overeating, even when our bodies don't need the fuel. It's like our brains are prioritizing immediate pleasure over our long-term health goals. Yeah, unfortunately. Okay, so we've got a lot going on here. We do. It seems like the brain's role in obesity is so much more complex than we give it credit for. It really is. But, you know, remember that temperature hypothesis from one of the articles, that certain areas of the hypothalamus are actually hotter than others? Maybe we could talk about that a little bit. Yeah, let's. Yeah, it is. It's a really fascinating area of research. Oh, sure. That article, a temperature hypothesis of hypothalamus-driven obesity, it suggests that this temperature difference could be linked to uh, you know, mitochondria, mitochondria, exactly. The powerhouses of the cell, the little powerhouses inside our cells that produce energy. Yeah. And what's really cool is that some studies have actually shown that if you manipulate the temperature of certain areas in the hypothalamus, oh wow, it can influence how much animals eat. Wait, so you're telling me that, like, by changing the temperature of certain brain regions, we could control appetite. Potentially, yeah. That sounds like science fiction. I know, right? But seriously, what are the like the implications for actually treating obesity in humans? I mean, it's definitely promising, mm -hmm. but it's really early stage research. Yeah. We need a lot more research before we can even think about applying this to humans. Yeah, that makes sense. There are so many things to consider, like safety, long-term consequences. Right, of course. Yeah, it's not something we can just jump into. But speaking of potentially radical treatments, there was that study on deep brain stimulation. DBS. Yeah, DBS, where they implanted electrodes in a specific part of the brain to change its activity. Yeah, hypothalamic deep brain stimulation reduces weight gain in an obesity animal model. That one. Yeah. I mean, DBS is already being used for things like Parkinson's disease. Right, exactly. And in the study, they used DBS in mini pigs. Wow. And they actually found that it reduced weight gain. That's incredible. I know, right? It's really amazing what they can do these days. But I imagine there are, you know, ethical considerations. Oh, absolutely. Especially with something like obesity. It's not, you know, immediately life-threatening. Right, exactly. It's a really tricky situation yeah. because DBS, it's a very invasive procedure. I mean, we're talking about altering brain function here. Yeah. So before we even consider this as an option for humans, we need a lot more research to really understand the risks and the benefits. Right. And even then, we have to think carefully about the ethics of it all. You know, are we crossing a line? Yeah. That's the big decision. You mentioned earlier that the bacteria in our gut, the microbiome, might also be playing a role in obesity. Yeah, it's amazing, right? Yeah, it's kind of wild. How can something living in our gut possibly affect our weight? 
Well, it turns out that all those trillions of bacteria living in our gut, they have a much bigger impact on our health than we originally thought. True. They affect how we extract energy from food, how we regulate our metabolism, even how our bodies respond to hormones like leptin. So, like, could we manipulate the gut microbiome, maybe through diet or probiotics or something, to treat obesity? It's a really interesting area of research. Yeah. Some studies have shown that certain types of gut bacteria are linked to weight loss or weight gain. But, you know, like most things in biology, it's probably not a simple answer. Right. We need more research to really tease apart that complex relationship between the gut microbiome, genetics, diet, all those lifestyle factors. Or gut bacteria. They're like another piece of this puzzle. Exactly. And they yeah. could be more important than we ever realized. Absolutely. But what about genetics? Do our genes determine our destiny when it comes to weight? Genes definitely play a role. Yeah. Right. Like there are these genome-wide association studies that have identified tons of genes that are linked to an individual's likelihood of developing obesity. So some people might just be like genetically predisposed to gain weight more easily than others. It does seem that way. But, you know, it's not fair. I know it doesn't seem fair, does it? <laughs> but it's important to remember that genes are not destiny. OK, they provide a blueprint, but our environment and the choices we make, those also have a big impact. So even if you're like predisposed to obesity, you can still take control of your health through lifestyle changes. Exactly. That's why things like diet, exercise, managing stress, getting enough sleep, all of that is so important. Those factors can influence how our genes are expressed, which basically means whether they're turned on or off. Wow. It's actually kind of empowering to know that we have at least some control over how our genes affect us. I think so, too. There was also that paper, uh, Treatment of Acquired Hypothalamic Obesity, Now and the Future, that focused on a specific type of obesity caused by damage to the hypothalamus. Right. And often from tumors or the treatment of tumors. Yeah, acquired hypothalamic obesity, it's particularly challenging to treat. How so? Well, because it directly messes with the brain's control center for energy balance. Right. And that can lead to, you know, rapid weight gain, hormonal imbalances, problems sleeping, even vision problems. Wow, that sounds awful. It can be really tough. So what are the treatment options for people with this condition? Honestly, current treatments, they're often not that effective. Yeah. The article mentions things like lifestyle changes, medications, even bariatric surgery, but there's no magic bullet. Wow. We definitely need more research to develop better, more targeted therapies that actually address the underlying problems. It seems like there's no one-size-fits-all solution to this. Not at all. But with all this research, it feels like we are moving towards a more holistic understanding of this you know, complex issue. Definitely. We're starting to realize that obesity isn't just about willpower or making the right choices. Yeah. It's this multifaceted condition influenced by biology, psychology, and our environment, you know, all these different factors. And that brings us to, I think, a really important point. Okay. If we want to effectively address obesity... We need to move beyond blaming individuals. Absolutely. We need to focus on creating an environment that actually supports healthy choices. Exactly. That means making sure that everyone has access to nutritious food, safe places to be active. Right. And it means providing education about the things that contribute to obesity. We also need to look at social determinants of health. Like poverty and food insecurity. Exactly. Those things can make it so much harder to maintain a healthy weight. It's about creating a society where everyone has a real chance to thrive. That's the goal. Yeah. It sounds like a huge task. It is, but it's important. It's necessary. Preventing obesity, it's not just about individual health. It's about creating a healthier and more equitable society for everyone. For sure. So we've talked about the challenges of treating obesity, some of the exciting new areas of research. Yeah. And the need for a more holistic approach. We've covered a lot. We have. But there's one piece we haven't touched on yet. What's that? Prevention. Ah, yes. Prevention. That's key. Yeah. What does prevention actually look like when we're talking about obesity? Well, it starts with early intervention, especially during childhood. Okay. You know, those habits that are established early in life, they can have a really long-lasting impact. So we need to get kids started with healthy eating habits and make <laughs> sure they're physically active. Exactly. But what about adults? Yeah. Are we doomed if we didn't develop those habits as kids? Not at all. 
It's never too late to make positive changes. That's good to hear. We need to like think about promoting healthy workplaces, encourage people to choose active transportation, and make sure that healthy, affordable food is available everywhere. So it's about making it easier for people to actually make healthy choices. Exactly. It sounds like prevention requires a lot of different groups to work together. It does. Like families, schools, communities, healthcare providers. Yep. Everyone needs to be on board if we really want to make a difference. Well, we've covered a lot of ground today. We have. From the amazing complexity of the brain to the social and environmental factors that contribute to obesity. This has been like a really eye-opening conversation. It has been. It really highlights how obesity is a complex public health problem. Yeah. It's not just about personal responsibility. We're not quite done yet. In part three of this deep dive, we're going to wrap up by looking at what the future might hold for this uh, this complex and challenging condition. Stay tuned. So welcome back to our deep dive into obesity. We've already covered so much. I mean, we've talked about how the brain regulates weight, the influence of those gut bacteria, even the interplay between genetics and our environment. And I think it's safe to say that obesity is way more complex than we usually give it credit for. Yeah, it really is. And as we keep learning more, it's important to keep in mind the ethics of all this new research and the treatments that might come out of it. Right. Like with all this talk of brain stimulation and messing with gut bacteria. Right. It's easy to, you know, get excited about the possibilities without thinking about, well, what could go wrong? Exactly. We have to be careful. Any new treatments need to be safe and effective, but they also need to respect the people who would be using them. Definitely. You know, one thing that really stood out to me when I was reading all this research yeah. was how much emphasis there is on, like, personal responsibility when it comes to obesity. Uh -huh. It's often framed as a willpower thing, you know? Yeah. Just make better choices. Right. And while individual choices definitely play a role, we can't just ignore the impact of biology and the environment. Right. We need to stop blaming people and start thinking about how we can create an environment where it's easier for everyone to be healthy. Yeah, I agree. It's not about letting individuals off the hook. It's about acknowledging that there are all these factors, many of them outside of our control, that influence our weight. Exactly. So, okay. What would creating a more supportive environment actually look like? Well, it would mean making sure everyone has access to healthy, affordable food. Yeah. It would mean making it easier to be physically active. Like safe places to exercise and stuff? Exactly. And it would mean educating people about healthy habits. Right, from a young age. Yes. And we also can't forget about things like poverty and food insecurity. Yeah. How do those fit in? Well, those are social determinants of health, and they can make it really hard to prioritize your health. Yeah, it's hard to worry about eating healthy when you're just trying to, you know, put food on the table. Exactly. So yeah. we need to address those issues as well. If we want to create a truly equitable society where everyone has a chance to be healthy. So it sounds like we need a pretty massive multi-pronged approach. Yeah, we do. It's going to take everyone working together. Individuals, families, schools, communities, policymakers, everyone. This deep dive has really been like a revelation for me. Really? Yeah. It's really opened my eyes to how complex obesity is. I'm glad to hear that. We've talked about so much. The brain, gut bacteria, genetics and environment, treatment, prevention, even the ethical consideration. Yeah, we've been busy. And all of it points to the fact that obesity is a complex public health issue. It really is. And it's not just about personal responsibility. That's such an important message. So before we wrap up, yeah. Just want to say a huge thank you to you for joining us on this journey. It's been my pleasure. And to everyone listening. Thanks for listening, everyone. We hope this deep dive has given you a better understanding of obesity and why we need to look at it from all angles. We can't solve this problem with simple solutions. No. It's going to take all of us working together. That's right. And the more we understand about obesity, yeah. the better equipped we'll be to come up with real lasting solutions that benefit everyone. Absolutely. Knowledge is power. And that's what this deep dive has been all about.